In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the Feast of St. Scholastica, and today I flew in from St. Louis. We are in the middle, we were in the middle of our post reception of the Cassic um, road trip. Usually, traditionally, even years ago with Bishop Williamson in the seminary, after the, the week after the taking of the cassock, there's a little break <clears throat> between the final exams, the happy event of the reception of the cassock, and then the re resuming studies the two weeks after. So during this week, we had the road trip with the seminarians, which took us this year to St. Mary's, Kansas, where we were there last Sunday, and there was quite a crowd actually for mass and the seminarians were there and brother and the priest and we were able to talk and spend a lot of time with the faithful and they really appreciated that many questions were answered and clarifications and of course the joy just of of uh, pulling together in this great battle here we are now what is it 52 years after the terrible nuclear blast within the Catholic Church by Vatican II and we're barely surviving with the Pope that is now just bulldozing what's left of the church. He's just betrayed the the catacomb Catholics in China by siding with the communist government and uh, acknowledging their communist bishops. It's a very serious betrayal. So here we are in this middle of the bombs dropping in this war, and it is nevertheless a great joy for Catholics to pull together who are all fighting. We're all fighting in the church militant, and we're all begging God to have mercy on us, and we want to start this Wednesday. will be Lent beginning. It is this Wednesday, right? Ash Wednesday, and we want to make a generous Lent with God to beg mercy for his holy catholic church for all the poor souls for the conversion of a pope this pope or whatever god wants to give as a solution he has the solutions we know that but we he sometimes will hold back until we pray and beg so let's make this lent special for that in reparation for sins and to beg god to have mercy because the state of the church <laughs> is just getting worse as we all know but nevertheless we had uh, was it, 10 or 11 seminarians and the, the priests after the trip to st mary's we went out to denver colorado and we got to see um, the biggest church in the world to catholic tradition which was built by father joe Pfeiffer, <laughs> the saint isidore's and uh, it's a magnificent Roman as structure it really is and it's quite an amazing feat in this day and age that there it stands a landmark on Highway 70 and, and when you fly into Denver you can see it the, the big cross on the transept and the nave so Father Pfeiffer says I hope it collapses before they say the new mass in it though so either the, the society priests and the society will come back to tradition in which case there'll be a huge split because there's a ton of liberal priests now who are all for the agreement, all for the modernist uh, absorption with the conciliar church. And as you're aware, um, I guess from the higher ups, they no longer want to call it the conciliar church that we're, that we're battling, that we refuse to be part of. Now that they want to change the name to official church. So there, all the lines that are clear that Archbishop Lefebvre laid down, and Christ laid down, and the Catholic tradition laid down, you don't cross these lines. Now they're being muddled up and made ambiguous. And once you do that with words and teachings, you fall into all kinds of errors. So, <clears throat> so the St. Isidore's Church, well, we stopped in and we... We went in to um, venerate, of course, pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Father Pfeiffer had a little bit of time to explain a little bit of the church. 
And then uh, we went to Mother Cabrini's shrine, where she had her house is now a village inn hotel on the very spot where her house was. But she started a summer house for the orphan girls, I guess probably to save them from the corrupt summers and uh, get them out from the city into the country. And out in the mountains, there's the famous Cabrini Shrine and off of Highway 70. It's easy to get onto, it's right there. In her day, she would have walked it up even in the age of, in her 50s, and I think even in her 60s. And she died in 2017, December 22nd. So she wasn't as, you know, she, she had a lot of, she had a lot in her. And Father Roberts actually picked up at the bookstore there uh, a book of her retreat notes. And something I never knew before, nor Father Roberts, nor Father Pfeiffer, mm -hmm. and I'm sure for you it might even be new news, is that how often during her travels of St. Francis Xavier Caprini, as you know, she went to New York City, she went out to Alaska, Seattle, she traveled enormous, like a society priest. Mm -hmm. She died in Chicago. She was in Denver, she was down in Louisiana, she went down to Buenos Aires, Argentina, in Brazil, and England, London, to found houses for the girls for teaching and hospital work, etc. But in the midst of all this, how often our Lord appeared to her. The apostles would appear to her, the Virgin Mary and her guardian angel. And in one of the visions, she sees a uh, this globe of fire hit the earth and spread all over. And it was our Lord telling her, I want you to go and spread the love of my heart all over the world. And as you know, St. Saint, 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 Saint Francis Xavier Caprini, when she went to Pope Leo XIII to ask him, what order do I go to for a missionary nuns? He said, there's not one that exists yet. You, you might as well start one. And she did. And her health wasn't that great. And she had kind of a, I think she had a limp also. But up in the shrine in Denver, you can drink some of the most refreshing, crystal clear water from the mountains you'll ever taste. And where does it come from? It comes when she, they, they tried to convince her that the city of Denver you can't build anything here because there's no water. She said, there's no water, huh? She says, God's stronger than man's opinions. She took her cane, which is actually a very thin thing, and she was very small, like St. Bernadette in size. She took her cane and struck a rock like Moses. And it has been flowing fresh water ever since. And that's one of the standing miracles and she, I guess, she certainly worked many, many miracles. Last year on the seminary trip, we saw where she died in the hospital and on the very chair that she died on. And there's blood stains in the rug when the blood poured out of her mouth when she died because she had uh, something in the lungs. Um, the blood stains are still there. Uh, and you can see that in Chicago. So anyway, back to Denver. <clears throat> The great St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, she uh, founded this house, and then she died in 1917, shortly after around that time. So interestingly enough, just a few miles from that shrine is the tomb of, of all people, <coughs> it's Buffalo Bill. But to our surprise, there was a lot of good news. You know, he might have been uh, involved very much in things of the world. He was actually, according to the documents there, a 32-degree Mason. Mm -hmm. And he dealt with a lot with the Indians. He was the one that brought in Indians. He had to talk with them, deal with them. So he had to, he had to be quite a very generous man, an adventurous man. And uh, he would put on, I guess, big shows for the... Americans to see the Wild West. We would even go to Europe. But interesting, 
by this is the uh, this is the, I'm reading directly from the plaque that's in that museum. By the end of 1916, Buffalo Bill, whose real name was William E. Cody, Buffalo Bill was gravely ill. During a visit to Glenwood Springs, he was told that he was dying. In January 1917, he arrived at his sister's house in Denver and word went out across the nation that the great scout was at death's door. So remember in that time, just around that time also, St. Francis Xavier had just been there. And she was now back in Chicago where she would die. So maybe all her prayers, uh, one, uh, one of these big sheep, one of these big souls. And uh, anyway, Buffalo Bill's last days were consumed with tying up loose ends. He wished to die a Catholic. So on January the 9th, 1917, he asked to be baptized by Father Christopher Walsh. Through those last hours, Buffalo Bill was lucid much of the time, giving directions for his funeral so his, to his family and friends. These included his desire to be buried four months later on Lookout Mountain. On January 19th, January 10th, 1917, one day after he was baptized, William F. Buffalo Bill Cody died. The cause of his death was listed on the certificate of death as uremic poisoning, which is a generic statement often used for what we would call today kidney failure. So there's an example of the power of grace and how we always have to pray for poor sinners. And here, this guy was a mason and high up, and he completely avoided the being trapped in death, eternal death, and separated from God in the last moment. So, as you know, he was lucky. He was at his sister's. So his sister's, his sister must have been quite a feisty girl, because the Freemasons usually gather around the bed of their members and block any priest, as, as happened to Voltaire, the famous Freemason Voltaire. <clears throat> and as he was dying, he was begging for a Catholic priest to come. And they said, there's no priest coming. We're your brothers. <clears throat> We're guarding you. And he died in despair, Voltaire. So anyway, also at the Cabrini Shrine, <clears throat> there, <laughs> there was, you can go up on the long staircase up the mountain, and there stands a huge statue of the heart of Jesus, Sacred Heart. But in front of it is, they still keep what she laid down with a whole bunch of rocks in the shape of the Sacred Heart of Jesus with a cross. So it's the cross with the heart of Jesus. And that, the very way she laid it down is how they preserve it right now. They didn't move, they didn't move it, they didn't uh, tamper with it. So <coughs> it's quite an impressive thing to see also. And we knelt down to pray there as well. And then in downtown Denver, in the Church of St. Elizabeth, this is of also great interest. And in that church, there was recently a sign in 19, if I get the dates right, 1907, I think it was. There was a priest from Germany, a Franciscan priest that came, he came to Patterson, New Jersey. And then from there, he was sent to Denver. And he had, in Patterson, New Jersey, in this is 1905, 1906, he would have been working very much with the poor and the very sick. And he actually risked his life many times with, with very contagious diseases, taking care of the dying. And a very good and holy priest, his name was Father Leo Heinrichs. Father Leo Heinrichs. So he was in Denver for five months as an assistant priest in the Church of St. Elizabeth. And one morning, on, I forget the exact day now, 
Um, but the priest that was assigned for the 6 o'clock morning mass on Sunday, he was feeling sick. So Father Leo Heinrich said, look, I'll take the 6 o'clock mass, and if you're feeling better, you can do the 8 o'clock mass. Agreed. Father offered the mass, 6 a.m., delivered the sermon, went on with mass, and was giving communion. And at the time of giving communion, there was an Italian radical anti-Catholic uh, anarchist who came up to communion. He received Holy Communion, and then he spat out the host in the face of Father Heinrichs and then shot him right in the heart, right at Mass. And the priest struggled to, to stay on his feet, and he carried the host, the consecrated host, in the Golden Ciborium. He struggled to walk his way to the closest altar, which was right now near the altar of Our Lady, one of the side altars. So if this was the church, you got the main altar, the altar of St. Joseph, and Our Lady's altar over here. And sad to say, we went into that church, and they completely destroyed it. There's no more communion rail, the main altar's gone, the side altars are gone, it's all modern, ugly destruction. Mm -hmm. Typical, as you know, of the barbarism of Vatican II. So he went, he tried to step up on the step to the altar, but he tripped. And he was dying. And he fell, and he said, my Lord and my God, because he, the host fell all over the floor. And the altar boys were trying to pick him up, and he died trying to put the host back in the ciborium. And he had told someone recently before that, I would love to die at the feet of Our Lady. That was one of his wishes. And she gave him his wish, and he died at the, her feet a martyr of the faith. And how do we know he's a martyr? Because this Italian anarchist stayed anti-Catholic and, and he hated priests. He wanted all of them dead and that he was executed actually by the Colorado um, government. It was a public execution. And he said at his death, right before his death, I hate the Catholic Church, I hate all priests, and I wish they were all dead. So it seems he died unrepentant, but he was killed out of hatred for the Catholic faith. And that's one of the definitions for a martyr. If you're killed out of hatred for the faith, that's a martyr. <coughs> so this beautiful church of St. Elizabeth on the outside, they wrecked it on the inside. It should be a, a monument to a, one of our heroic martyrs of our country. And there are many, believe it or not, there's a lot of martyrs, especially from at the hands of the Indians and the Protestants. So you could at least, Father Heinrichs is not canonized nor even beatified. He may be venerable or servant of God, but I'm not aware of that. But you could certainly pray to him for all the priests. Because we're in the age of martyrdom for the priests. And this martyrdom may come to blood. We know that. It's in our country is becoming more and more communist being more suffocated by communist laws, socialism uh, encroaching everywhere, and it's a, certainly a punishment for our sins over our nation. But um, we're certainly, all of us, it's not just the priests, all of you, we're suffering a white martyrdom, and it's a glorious martyrdom, and maybe, maybe even more meritorious in a certain way than the martyrdom of blood. Because a martyr gets shot, his soul goes straight to heaven, and it sounds easy, and with God's grace it is easy. You had saints who died laughing in the midst of being burnt alive. So, but this martyrdom that God is asking of us is a slow roasting. The slow martyrdom of being ostracized by our old parishes, by our old SSPX, because we want to hold the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, which they have betrayed. And Bishop Follet has given another proof of this betrayal by pushing this whole idea of dropping the conciliar church and just call it the official church. There's no more a battle. It's now about making peace with the enemy. And the Catholics don't do that. Christ never made peace with darkness. He made war against darkness. 
And in this war, we, we got to suffer. And that's why we suffered through these six years since 2012, six years of this battle and uh, constant upheaval in the, 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 the trenches of Catholic tradition. And the devil is trying to destroy what he can, and especially a seminary where future priests are possibly going to come. He doesn't want seminaries. And remember all the hatred that was unleashed by the French bishops, by Rome, modernist Rome, and all the modernists against Archbishop Lefebvre and the, the little modest, little seminary of Ecolme. And all hell was unleashed to destroy it. But it peacefully went on. And our, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. He made heaven and earth. He created heaven and earth. No problem for him. So his church will last till the end of the world. And this is an honor for us, even though we have to be truthful. None of us deserve this grace. Not any of us, especially myself. We don't deserve this grace. And we always got to remember that. This fire of the faith, this light that Christ gave to the apostles and to his Catholic Church, if you have been given this, and it is a gift, we must be so grateful, and we must love and grow in the love of God, in the heart of Jesus and Mary. As Father Heinrichs, a martyr for the, for the Holy Faith in the Mass, mm -hmm. as St. Saint, 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 Saint Francis Xavier Caprini, Ask these great saints and your patron saint. They all are in heaven and they see the battle we're in. And they, they're close to us. They are not up in the clouds. They really are close to us. Because they know the suffering and they know the battle we are in. And some of the saints, like St. Saint Louis de Montfort, he saw those days coming and he envied the Catholics of our day. That you can proclaim the kingship of Christ in an age that just mocks him and puts him on a level of all false religion. And we proclaim to the world, the only solution to the world's problems is Jesus Christ the King and his Holy Catholic Church of tradition. Nothing else. And then the source of all grace from his most sacred heart, the traditional seven sacraments. And as, as Pius X said when he condemned modernism, these modernists are so audacious, so bold, as to dare to keep the name of the sacraments on the outside and gut out and fill it with poison on the inside. And this is exactly what we've seen happen since Vatican II. Baptism, the Holy Eucharist, the Mass, the Sacrament of Extreme Unction, they've all been changed. And many of them even, no doubt, not even valid. And even as Archbishop Lefebvre said back in the 80s, the priests do not know anymore the faith. And if the priest no longer believes that the Mass is a sacrifice, and his theology training is so bad, and all modernists, that's not a valid Mass, because he just doesn't know. It might not even be his fault. He just might be a, a young, badly trained, badly formed priest. But he doesn't know. And there's no valid Mass. So... So, dear faithful, this is, uh, this is the great feast of St. Scholastica. And she teaches us one great thing. And that is, have great desires to do things for God. Have great desires to see the face of the Blessed Trinity. Have great desires to grow in the love of God. Have great desires like St. Francis Xavier Caprini and many missionaries like St. Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius, and, <coughs> and St. Isaac Jobs, and St. John Brebeuf, to spread the faith. To, when people talk about most what they love, and without being fake, without being artificial, it should come naturally in our conversations about the things of the faith, the love of the faith, the spreading of the faith. This should be quite natural in any family conversation. And when dealing with pagans in the world and co-workers that are not Catholic, certainly the, your example speaks a lot. 
And you all know this, that what St. Francis of Assisi, he told his, I think it was Brother Juniper, we're going to go to this town and we're going to preach in this town. So Father, Brother Juniper thought, well, that's great, let's go. So they walked through the town and St. Francis walked right through the town and he didn't say a word. But there they were in their brown Franciscan habits. And when they got out on the other side of the town, Brother Juniper said, um, Brother Francis, I thought we were going to preach. And St. Francis said, we did. We walked through the town. We're in the habit of poverty, chastity, obedience, blessed by the church. And that was our preaching. And St. Francis used to say, I always preach, and sometimes with words. So your example. Your honesty in business. That's why uh, Muslims and Jews, they love to hire Catholics <laughs> to, to, the, to work for them because Catholics are not supposed to lie and are supposed to be cheating because the commandments forbid this. So good Catholics strive for this and that's why they are loved by uh, you know, powerful business, businesses. But that's the way it is. We, we have to give that good example. And uh, to be faithful to your marriage vows, to dress with modesty and according to your nature. Men dress manly, the women dress feminine. That's the way it is. And the modern stupidity of these liberal feminists who want to tear down everything left of the, of the natural order. So we got to stand by both the natural order and the, the order that God gave, which protects the natural order. It's built on it. So, have great desires to do great things for God. Let me just um, close with that example of St. Scholastica. I know this is getting long, sorry. But um, I won't give her a whole life, but just the one night. The night she was about to die, she didn't know. She probably had a premonition that she was going to die. But... Uh, it was a rare occasion, once a year, St. Benedict would visit his sister, who had the convent of nuns not far from the monastery in Monte Cassino. And on one of his rare visits, they were talking, and it was getting towards evening, and he was, going, he was about to get up to walk back to the <coughs> monastery. But St. Scholastica prayed that God would allow a terrible rainstorm and lightning storm to stop him so she could continue talking with her brother because they were talking all day about heaven and about the truths of the faith and about the love of God and the monastic rule etc etc and how to help form souls to love God so God heard her prayers as he does to many of his beloved souls on earth he heard her prayers and sent a massive storm so St. Benedict was obliged to stay longer and, and then finally made his way back to the monastery the next day. But St. Scholastica, when he arrived in Monte Cassino, he looked back at the convent of the nuns and he saw a white dove, a shining white dove, fly its way to heaven. And by that he knew that was his sister who had just died. And, um, before she died, she wanted to have more time with him. So, so God filled her desires. And that's what St. Gertrude says to us. God loved her very much because she loved to desire great things for God. And the Holy Ghost praises Daniel in the Old Testament for being a man of great desires. And we must, we must ask God that grace to desire great things of God. That his heart be loved all over the world. That Christ the King be loved and adored all over the world. This should burn in us, this desire. This, this longing that Christ be honored and glorified. And the saints burnt with this. And Christ is the one who inflamed it from his own sacred heart. When he said, I've come to cast fire on the earth. And what do I desire but that this fire be enkindled? and kindled in men's hearts and minds. So, speaking of having great desires, 
Let me conclude with this quote from the words of St. John. When Christ is near the treasury in the temple and the Jews surround him, and he, 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 uh, he defends his union with the Father, with these Jews, and he says to the Jews, the Pharisees, you are from beneath. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. So this is what Christ saying to the Pharisees, and he reads their hearts. They're, they're, as, as you know, they cheated with the money, they were oppressing the widows, they were oppressing the poor, they were telling young men who should have given their, some of their money at least to their parents, the Pharisees were teaching them, no, it goes to the temple. It goes to the temple. But a, any good priest and any Old Testament priest would say, no, you take care of your parents. That's the fourth commandment. And any extra, anything, take care of your parents, but don't neglect the temple either. That goes to the, the glory of God, etc. But these Pharisees were saying, no, don't take care of your parents. Give it all to the, to the temple. And they were abusing the money. They were, they were not having mercy on the poor. And this is why our Lord unleashed on them when uh, he preached to them. So here's the commentary of Father Cornelius Alapine. Christ explains, as if to say, you are hellish, and you imitate your father, the devil, because as he killed Adam by the forbidden fruit, so do you wish to kill me. But I am from above, Christ says, because I am the Son of the Most High God. Listen to what St. Augustine says on this passage. He, Christ, was from above. But how was he from above? From the air? By no means, for there the birds do fly. From the heaven we see? By no means, says St. Augustine, for there the stars, the sun, and the moon go their rounds. From the angels, do not imagine it, for they too were made by him, by whom all things were made. How then was Christ from above? From the Father himself. From the Father himself. For there is nothing above God who begat the word equal to himself, co-eternal with himself, his only begotten before time, through whom he would create the times. Understand, therefore, Christ to be from above in this way, that he transcends in thy conception everything that was made, all of creation. He transcends every body, every created spirit, everything that is in any way subject to change. So Christ is one with the Father, and it's he that we must desire. And this is why the, the Holy Ghost says these great words. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's baptism and the state of grace. In fact, this statement you are from beneath, I am from above, is identical, therefore, with what St. John said in chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, he gave them power to be made the sons of God, to them that believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. So not by naturalism, not by bloodline of, of nobility, not by even human willing it, nor the flesh, but those born of God. He gives power to be sons of God, born of God. That is God choosing the soul, giving you to know the faith, giving you to live in the state of grace and to fight for the holy faith in these days. And with, and with what the apostle says, the first man was of the earth, earthly, the second man from heaven, heavenly. Such as is the earthly, 
such also are the earthly. And such as is the heavenly, such also are they that are heavenly. Therefore, as we are born the image of the earthly, let us bear also the image of the heavenly. That's 1 Corinthians 15. And with the statement, if you be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Mind the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth. So Christ wants us to be heavenly minded and not earthly, not loving this world for its own sake. Because it's empty anyway. And we're going to leave this world anyway. So best we leave this world having fought for the faith, grown in the love of God, spread the works of charity with the desire to, to burn this whole earth with the fire of the heart of Jesus. So that everywhere from pole to pole, all will proclaim his kingship. That has to be in us. So we got to pray for that great desire. So let's turn to St. Scholastica, a saint of great desires, and all those saints who are really our big brothers, our big sisters in heaven. They really are close to us. They are such good friends. And God's honored when we honored them. He wants us to honor the saints, to pray to them. So let's ask their help to really grow in virtue, grow in desire, and grow in the love of God till we come to see him face to face and the happiness of heaven, which joy I wish for all of you in this Holy Mass and all your families and so many souls who are on the way to hell. We gotta pray for these poor souls and love them with the love of the Virgin Mary. Because she doesn't want any, like our Lord, she doesn't want to see any of them damned. And if they're damned, it's by their own will. But she still wants them saved and she wants us to help them. So persevere in the daily rosary, wear the scapular, and, and prepare for a, a very good Lent, a generous Lent, especially by prayer, almsgiving, and uh, fasting, and growing in the love of God. Ask this great grace in this Holy Mass. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.